So learn the learning zone versus the performance zone and learn when you should go into the performance zone and when you need to stay in the learning zone. This will change your life. Before we get started, I gotta do the 2022 thing. So we gotta take one selfie here, okay? I always love taking selfies. So on three, I want everybody to stand up and go crazy. Ready? One, two, three. Awesome. I accidentally hit the power button. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm gonna set my timer here just so I stay on time for y'all. Do you mind if I put this right over here? Awesome. So, show of hands, I'm gonna try not to walk in front of my screen here, but I don't like being on stages. I like being a man of the people, if you will. Um, show of hands, doctors, raise your hands nice and high, so I can, I'm not picking on you, I swear, I just wanna know. I just gotta give this guy here a hug, Sean Carlson. Oh, I love you, brother. I haven't seen this guy in forever, I'm sorry. You sit front row, that's what you're getting. It's like a Gallagher concert. Um, so doctors I saw, who here is admin? Who here is clinical? Awesome. So for those of you who don't have a doctor in the room, they're gonna hate you <laughs> when this is over because you're gonna go through so much stuff with them um, that you're gonna bring back, hopefully. And we're gonna work on a lot of things here. This just isn't about stress. This isn't just about growing your practice. Um, this is about life, this is about purpose, this is about meaning. I don't care if you're a doctor, you'll notice I didn't say a doctor's purpose. This is just about purpose in your life. Um, that's one of my missions, and, and we'll, we'll get into some of that stuff as we move through this. So, so I just want to disclose up front that I do have a financial interest in orthopreneurs, as you heard Dino talk about a little bit. I do have a financial interest in OrthoFi, and I did partner with Smile Doctors uh, OSO last year. So I just want to get that out of the way and be fully transparent with everything. Anybody who knows me knows full well that my affiliations financially never play any role whatsoever in what I say or do. Uh, anybody who knows me, they know they can't tell me what to do. I'm kind of a live wire. But I just wanted to get that out of the way a little bit and talk about it. So this is what today's going to be like a little bit for all of you, okay? So just open wide. We're going at this, all right? Because there's going to be a lot of stuff as we move through this. So. Most people know, by the way, anybody here, doctors, a member of the Orthopreneurs Group Facebook group? Right on. Uh, anybody here listen to the podcast? Okay, there's the five of you. I knew there were five of you who listened. So um, for those of you who know my story, I was a restorative dentist. I graduated in 1992 from the University of Buffalo Dental School. Um, became a restorative dentist and committed myself for the next 20 years to literally becoming the best ortho, uh, general dentist I could possibly be. Um, my practice became more and more of, about knowing less and less, right? So I, I narrowed my focus so that I only know how to do certain things really, really well. And if a case had really very little chance of being saved, it somehow ended up in my lap. And what you see here is what I saw every single day in my practice. It was rewarding. It was wonderful. I loved doing it. So this is the stuff that I was seeing on a regular basis in my practice. I would show this to every doctor in my neighborhood and they'd be like, I'm not touching it. My periodontist wouldn't give opinions. I see all the eyeballs roll back, but I love this. I love being in that make it or break it environment, all right? So when we talk about ortho, what's really our, our liability in ortho, right? Oh, it didn't turn into total class one, which is a big deal. You screw this one up, you got a totally different kind of day. But after 20 years of doing this, my wife, who is isolated with me in Seattle, we're from New York, um, she got tired. She said, I wanna move back. You know, I, I, wonder, I don't wanna go to New York, but I wanna get out of Seattle. It's too dark, it's too rainy. I loved it, it was amazing, but if you have any degree of mental health issue, it does become a burden. And so that's when I, I said, hey, you know, we'll get out of here. Um, this was that case. Um, that we moved from A to B. This is the kind of stuff I loved doing on a regular basis, taking you know, this woman who just had decay everywhere under the roots and turning her into one of the first ever zirconia framed, you guys don't care about that, but for me, this is like one of the first zirconia framed upper and lower implant supported prosthesis in the United States. My lab bill on that was $17,900 for the lab bill alone. So it was a different kind of life. You can't see the picture really well, but in 2012, that's me, first day of ortho residency at age 44. So I practiced 20 years, as a restorative dentist in Seattle, tried to get to the top of my game, and when my wife said, hey, let's go get out of Seattle, I remember two weeks later at around 2 a.m., I woke her up in the middle of the night, and I said, hey, honey, I, I have a question for you, something I have to tell you, and that can never be good, right? Um, and she's like, what? I said, I think I wanna go back and become an orthodontist. 
And she said, why? I said, because I figure as a general dentist, I can help patients. And even back then I said this, as an orthodontist, I think I can help other people, other, other clinicians. I didn't feel I could do that as a general dentist. And I wanted to move teeth and I wanted to be more cerebral and I wanted to work until I couldn't work any longer, not physically, but mentally. And so um, she said, could we afford it? I said, no. No, we haven't planned for it. And so um, as a lesson to everybody out there, at age 44, I went back to school. I applied to 50, 52 schools, I think it was. Got rejected from all 52. Didn't get in anywhere. I know, it's OK. No, there's no animosity. I meet some of the people who run the programs. They come up and apologize. There's no hard feelings. You have amazing candidates out there. And let's be honest, a 44-year-old going back to residency can only kind of cause problems, right? So I, my wife said I could reapply a second time. And I got in the second time, and I went to the Nova Southeastern University in Florida um, and just had an amazing time there. And this was like my first day in 2012, first day going back to school. I should have had like one of those signs, like first day of school, <laughs> right? Um, and so let's fast forward a couple of years. My life in 2016, um, I had $315,000 of student debt, because remember, I didn't plan for this. Right? But I always believed in myself. I never thought I was going to fail. So who cares? Set your dream, believe in yourself, and go for it. I, I had depleted most of our savings at that point. Um, we were almost all out of our retirement savings at that point. I was out of school two years, but I had a startup, and it takes a while for cash to get going. I have two special need kids who are in school and prescriptions and schooling and treatment and therapy. It costs a lot of money. And I had one de novo practice with my partner, and I was working a side job on Sundays and the rest of the week to pay the bills. And my partner, who's one of the greatest guys on the planet, Dr. Doug Shaw, I'm going to give him a shout out, um, he used to say to me, how do you sleep at night? And I say, because money is unimportant. I mean, honestly, think about life, right? You've got a roof over your head, and you've got food on the table, and you've got loved ones around you, and you're in good shape. Money doesn't matter. It'll come to you. Don't piss it all away. Be smart. But money can't make you happy. And there's a great book by Jacob Needleman that I read called Money and the Meaning of Life. And it makes you realize that a dollar, my dollar is the same dollar that Sean has in his pocket. It's fungible. It doesn't matter. They come, they go, but they can't make you happy. So if you've got a dream and money's holding you back, build a bridge and get past it, as they used to say, because you can do it. So here I am, and I said, you know what? My social capital is really connecting people. Anybody who spends any time with me for five minutes knows that if I'm with you for five minutes, three minutes will be connecting you to somebody in the conversation. Hey, do you know, do you know, do you guys know? That's who I was always. I go to parties and I had a great time, not because of the party, but because I was connecting people at the party the whole time, just to see them do better. And so I, one day I saw this video. Anybody know who this is? Raise your hand high if you know who this guy is, right? It's a shame if you don't know who this guy is. His name is Gary Vaynerchuk. He used to run his parents' liquor store in New Jersey uh, using social media. He started something called Wine Spectator TV back when YouTube, like 2002, three. And he started doing wine reviews online, but he did it like every man. Like, this wine tastes like mud. This wine tastes like grass that came out of my mower. Like he did, and he built his parents' shop, I think from like two or three million to $40 million. A liquor store in New Jersey in a matter of several years. And he's now running VaynerMedia, which is like a $300 million marketing company. But he had at the time a $29 course. And when I later met him, I was like, dude, your $29 course changed my life. And it was building your personal brand. Because I knew for sure that I wanted to help people. I just didn't know how. But I knew that I had to go through some steps to get there. So he had building a personal brand. I paid $29 on Udemy. And I took this course. And from that, Orthopreneurs was born. If you haven't heard of Orthopreneurs, I'm going to give you a quick little rundown of what it is so you understand it. It's an online place on Facebook where I really, anybody who's an orthodontist, I'm sorry, team members, it's only for doctors, but get your doctor to join. Practices can't join. But the whole goal is for people to come together and help each other. Hey, by the way, any good marketing ideas for January? Hey, I, I have a problem. My assistant's going out for eight weeks. I don't know how to cover for any suggestions. Hey, I've got a restorative dentist who just sucks, right? What do I do? And so it's a great place to bring people together. It's totally free. Um, we, right now, we have over 6,300 orthodontists from 99 countries. I didn't even know Isle of Man had an orthodontist, to be quite honest. And like I said, any orthodontist can join if they want to. From that came Orthopreneurs RD. RD is a, a different kind of place. Any RDers in the room? Anybody? I see one hand go up. Thank you, Bill. Um, but Arthur's RD, the RD just stands for regional dominance. It's a stupid name I came up off the top of my bat. But basically, if I'm in Dallas and I type a question in Orthopreneurs, 
and I say, hey, um, anybody got some great marketing ideas? And Sean is in Florida, and I know he's in California, but he's in Florida for this story, and, and, and he's gonna give an answer. But all of a sudden he notices that she's down the block from him as well, and she's in the group, and he doesn't wanna give his answer. Now that's a, a, a small mindset, I'm an abundance mentality kind of guy, but for many people, they don't wanna have a competitor when they're talking about advice. So Orthopedics RD, was a, it's, it's got a geographic exclusivity, so no two doctors in the same area can be a part of it. It's a place we really, really, it's like a nudist colony. We just all just see everything, right? We share everything together. There's webinars, it's a lot of fun, um, but really those in it really refer to it as a tribe. What did you say that, Bill? He's, he's nodding. Yeah, the, he's still thinking about nudist colony. And then, for, and then, then came the summit, right? So anybody here been to summit? Right on. I hope you had a good time. Uh, next year is in Orlando, I think. It started in 2018. A uh, funny story real quickly about not worrying about money, because you'll see that's a theme in my life. My father was a dentist, and I went to work with him. He had five practices, and I walked away from that. Why? Because money wasn't important. Um, I went for work for a prosthodontist who wanted to basically make me his partner, and I moved to Seattle. Why? Because money wasn't important. Um, money shouldn't drive anything. And when I started Summit, we signed on the dotted line. For those of you who don't know it, when you, when you have a meeting, you have to get a sign for rooms, right? So we had a $274,000 room bill that I had to personally guarantee. And remember, I had no money in the bank. And my, we, we were eating lunch, and my partner's looking at me, and he trusts me. And in the middle of lunch, he just looks at me and goes, he drops his part and goes, how are you not nervous? I said, because it's going to work out. It's going to be fine. And it did. And we did exactly what we wanted to do. Next year's on. This is what it looks like. Um, I... I basically pled all the stops and put every penny back into it to give an experience that's better than anything you've hopefully ever seen at any meeting anywhere. That's the whole goal of it. Sean and I drank beers on stage at the, at the first one. You remember that? That was fun. This was this year. We were in, um, gosh, my brain is completely fresh. What? Austin. Thank you. Yeah, this was Austin. It was only like a month and a half ago, but I think I've aged 10 years. So this was, this was um, in Austin. Uh, podcast, again, if you ever want to listen, I bring on guests from all walks of orthodontic life, and every Friday I just do a five-minute Friday where I try to dispense some sort of wisdom. Now, this is where everything really starts. This was me with about 250 amazing kids from my practice as we were launching Onward, right? You remember that movie Onward? Great movie for, for kids. They loved it. And that was March 8th, 2020. Little did we know, because, but on March 17th, 2020, that was us. That was basically a little over a week later. It's like surreal. It's hard to even remember these days. It's crazy what we went through. I was sitting in my car outside of Costco watching people stand in line to buy toilet paper. Like it's one of those stories that your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren would come and ask you, what was it like? Hopefully we never go through it again. Hopefully it's a once in a lifetime. But that was 10 days later with us. How many of you did an exam for a patient in a car or delivered a retainer in a car or something? Like if I told you a year earlier, you'd be in gloves out in a car with a mask doing this, you would have thought it was crazy. And so life has changed considerably. I think it, in many good ways and in many bad ways, it's changed irreparably. It's never going back in my opinion. And today our lives are very different. Look at inflation. If you're not worrying a little bit about a coming recession, right? there's a lot on our minds as business owners, as employees, as team members. We worry about stuff. Raise your hand, nice and high, if you have way more team members than you've ever needed. Right on, one hand in the whole room, two, three hands. If you've got more team members than you need, God bless you, because I've been working shorthanded for two years. Anybody else working a little shorthanded? Yeah, and the rest of you who didn't put your hands up. And of course, stress. Working shorthanded makes you, all of a sudden, you gotta start making some ethical decisions. Am I gonna run 45 minutes behind or am I gonna do what's right for this patient? You've been there, you know what I'm talking about. And so now more than ever, I think, we just need simpler, easier, profitable, predictable. There's a million other things I could add to this list, but we can focus on those for right now. Now remember, my mission statement of orthopreneurs is to help orthodontists lead more profitable, lower stress lives. That's my whole purpose. And I will ask you, you saw the slide earlier, I'm gonna ask you, start giving some thought to what your purpose is. What is it you want in your life? I've said to my family over and over and over again, when I pass, hopefully many years from now, if anybody stands up and says to them, you know, your father was one hell of an orthodontist, I told them to smack him. <laughs> 
Because if you remember me as an orthodontist, then I failed at my job. I'm not an orthodontist. I do orthodontics, but I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm a community member. I'm a teacher. I've got about 15 things I am. An orthodontist is way down the list. Doesn't mean I take it any less serious when I'm there. But that's not what I want to be remembered for. And I ask all of you right now, start thinking a little bit about what it is you want to be remembered for. I don't care if you're a sterile tech who just started last week or you've been in practice for 40 years. Start giving some thought, not a legacy, but what drives you every day in your life? What is your social capital? What is it that when you wake up in the morning, money doesn't matter anymore, you've got money, what is it you woke up in the morning and want to do? And don't tell me it's play golf. That's fun. But what is it that you wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to change the world because I'm going to do blank. And if you don't want to change the world, well, then we have to talk even more. So let's talk about four things that are going to help you grow your practice and lower your stress, because that's what I'm here for today. Want more starts? That wouldn't be bad, right? We want better clinical images because if I've got good documentation, I'm going to get more of the more starts. I want a more positive team culture because you can never be too happy, right? And we want less errors. It's so frustrating, isn't it? When you look at the chart notes and it says 1925 NITI and it's an 016. And what's the first thing you say? Who was the assistant last time? Right? You always do that? Or the patient's wearing class two elastics, but they're really supposed to be in class three? Like, is it like the family feud when like you turn over the extra answers and everybody's responding? Right? Like, but, but if you can remove the errors from my life, life would be way, 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 way better. Right? So I think we're, we can focus on tons more things, but let's hit those today. So let's talk about starts. Um, as you may have seen, I'm sponsored by OrthoFi to be up here, but I'm only going to talk about a few things related to them. This slide comes from my friend Jamie Reynolds. Jamie is a data superstar. Jamie really understands numbers really well. He helped found OrthoFi. All I want you to look at here, the really important numbers are 2021 versus 2022. If you use gauge, any gauge users here? Right on. Um, if, you're, if you use gauge, you're up 21.5%. Kane Waters, which is a big accounting firm, roughly the same. If you're an OrthoFi user, any OrthoFi users? Right on. So, or it's just self-selecting groups, right? It's a little bit higher. But everybody on the planet, when I, when I associated with Smile Doctors at the end of 2021, everybody was going to go, oh, no, no, I don't want to join any OSO. Next year is going to be monstrous. And I've been saying, and you'll hear the podcast, and you see it in writing for the last 18 months, that 2021 was an anomaly. It shouldn't have happened. 2020, 2020 shouldn't have happened. We got killed because of COVID, right? We were closed. I don't know how long you were closed. I know I'm in California. I know you closed a while. In Texas, I was closed six weeks. I knew you probably closed much longer. But we got killed in 2020. And then 21, 21 came around. Nobody's traveling. Nobody's eating out, right? And everybody's got all this extra money. They're staring at themselves in the mirror all day long at home, and they want a better smile. And everybody went from a million and a half to two and a half million dollars and said, next year, I'm going to do four. And I said... Give me some of what you're smoking. <laughs> because it was an anomaly. And now the, the numbers will show you that the average practice, 22 over 21, is down. 8% if you go by gauge, roughly 6% if you're at OrthoFi. And if you speak to my friends, I know people down 20, 25, 30%. It's a lesson, right? As I tell all younger residents, when life is bad, it's never as bad as you think it is. It's going to get better. When life is amazing, it's never as good as you think it is. It's going to get worse. That's life. Anybody been around long enough to enjoy it? You know what I'm talking about. So it's going to come back up. This is not doom and gloom. It's going to be amazing, right? I bet on myself. You should bet on yourself. You're in an amazing profession that is really hard to go bankrupt. Just do right by your patients and things will come back. But I just wanted to show you that what happened was, it a, was a bit of an anomaly. So, you know, again, this is also from Jamie. Were we asleep at the wheel? We know what happened here. You know, this is the crazy number right here. This number blows me away. 98% of 21 growth came between March and May. Your growth, not your, all your income, obviously, but the amount that put you over, according to their numbers. And remember, OrthoFi manages patient financing of up over $2.5 billion as of right now. They are as much a financing company as they are a data company. So their data is really solid. They've got a lot of doctors in there, and I really like looking at it. But think about that, right? So when we talk about more starts, remember a couple of things, because it's not on your TC. Who here is a TC? Go, buy out a bull, go out and buy a bullwhip. 
And the next time anybody says it's your fault, just whoosh, get them. Because it, can it be the TC's fault? Absolutely. It can be. But don't put it on your TC until you make sure everything else is, and I'm going to show you what those things are. So it starts with the first contact. We know that. And there are things you can do in the room to increase the case acceptance. We're going to talk about that. Because it is a process. Right? We talk about ortho. We have literature. Like I said, I, I hate to pick on Sean, but he's a data scientist. This guy knows his literature, his science. We make choices based on science. Well, you know what? There's a science to selling. And I've been following it since I'm a kid because it was a passion, seeing what turns in people's head. Right? I was the guy who organized a crew of guys whenever it snowed, so we'd go out and we'd take over the neighborhood and shovel driveways. Right? I always had a business because I enjoyed it. It wasn't the money. It was creating something. It was connecting people. That's who I've always been. So there is a science behind this. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Anybody ever heard of Robert Cialdini? Raise your hand high. See, that's, to me, it's a shame that only three people, five people in the room have heard of him. He's a PhD. I think he trained at Columbia. He's taught at some of the most prestigious universities in the country. His first book, Influence, I think it was, was 1984. It is a tough read. But he went three years undercover, doing undercover research, car salesmen, and, and those sorts of things, learning about what made people want to buy. You read those books and get through them and make notes, TCs, you will have an unfair advantage in the room. Not, now, crystal clear, right? If this was like a dummies course, you'd see the guy with the yellow and black with the finger like this. Warning, we don't manipulate, we don't lie, we don't cheat. Our goal here is to educate and to use every right tool in our toolbox to motivate people towards choices that are in their best interest. I want to be clear about that. So those two books are amazing. He outlines so much data from studies in there. It's incredible. Things from color that helps people buy that you all know about now. But this was almost 40 years ago. He's the guy who made that happen, where we knew what colors motivated people to buy things, what numbers. You know, it ends with an eight or a five, and it's over this amount. It's unbelievable, the science they have on it. So let's talk about the process itself. The call, what we're going to call discovery number one, because that's what the call is all about. And that's what they call it in a lot of sales courses. We're going to talk about a trial close, the data handoff, and discovery number two, which is done by the TC. Now, again, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you, and I apologize. The last thing we're going to hit here is the close. Now, when I start talking about business and sales, this is what most orthodontists want to do. If I was going to show an open bite case that I just closed down using TADS, they'd all run to me. The moment I start talking about the sales process, everybody instinctively runs away because that's not what you signed up for. You signed up to straighten teeth. What's all this business stuff we got to do? So this is where they usually run out the door, but we're going to talk right now about discovery number one. And again, I got so much to go through, and I'm just going to try to fly through this. I apologize. I literally could give a two-day course on this because I just love this so much, and I'm trying to cram a lot into an hour. So this is our call sheet. If you message me on Facebook, I'll make sure I get it back to you. I'll give it to you. But it's been built based upon personal and probably four consultants. By the way, Andrea Cook, anybody get to see her talk? Isn't she amazing? Yeah, she's awesome. I'll give her a shout out. I, um, I'm building a new office. And just yesterday, she texted me because I'm using her for sterilization area because she's just brilliant. And like, I don't think either one of us knew that we'd be following each other here today, which is kind of cool. So we gave each other a hug. It was nice. But this was built from probably four consultants plus some of my background. And basically, it covers everything. Now, when you do this, it's on colored paper. So when someone's answering the phone and using it, you don't bother them. You see that colored paper, leave them alone. They're dealing with a new patient. You need meticulous training on how to do it. You got to role play this stuff and you gotta record calls, but we're gonna get into that in a little bit. So, who here has heard of a trial close? Who here has ever done a trial close? Come on, every one of you has done a trial close. Who here has ever dated somebody? Nobody ever dated anybody. Wow, you guys, just, you went straight to marriage, that's awesome. Arranged marriage is all. So, <clears throat> if I met my wife, which I did 35 years ago, something motivated me to say, hey, you wanna go on a date? Right? Just bluntly. Hey, you want to go on a date? You just don't walk up and, hey, want to go on a date? Hey, you want to go on a date? Like, my son is on the spectrum. He might do that. Right? He used to ask other kids in his class, hey, want to have a sleepover? 
like, they don't even know who you are, dude. The, like, he, and he was 22. No, I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> but you, you learn something by testing the waters first, right? Maybe you said something and saw if they laughed. Maybe you said something and see if they made eye contact. But that's a trial close. You were testing the waters to find out if you could go take the next step before you did it. And that's a trial close. Every one of you does a trial close every day. Anytime there's anything in your life that you've wanted to ask somebody else for, unless you were ridiculously blunt, you did a trial close. In our case, a trial close is this right here. Once they've gotten all the information, all they say to the patient is, and to let you know, if Dr. Krieger feels that little Timmy is ready, we might be able to save you an appointment by getting started that day. How does that sound? And then shut up. How does that sound? Now they're gonna either say to you, amazing, I hate him missing school. If you can save us an appointment, we are ready to get started. We were referred by six of your families. We know you're amazing, and we got more money than we know what to do with. Your typical patient, right? And so, in that case, she'd write that in quotation marks. We have more money than we know what to do with, and we're ready to start. And I would call that a five. Now, you know what you got. Or the other hand is, no, 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 no. We don't even know who you guys are. We, we're going for three other consults. We don't know you, right? That might be a one. And there are verbal skills that you should be training to say back to those people. But for right now, you're just, you're collecting data. You're getting information because your TC is going to use this information later. So you got to have it in your hands as quickly as possible. Isn't it like, raise your hands if you're totally annoyed when a patient shows up 10 minutes late, no paperwork, TC hasn't checked benefits, no idea, right? So annoying, it's horrible. And, and your chances of closing those cases go down considerably. Because like you're getting data at the last second, you don't know what to deal, you, there was no data collection one, right? there's no discovery. So give them the best chance to get the outcome everybody wants, and there's lots of options out there about how you can do it. For us, we use OrthoFi, obviously, we love that. They do a lot of the, the, the insurance stuff, they do a lot of the sending the paperwork stuff, and again, for that alone, I love it because I need this data in my hand. I've got to have it so I can have a conversation uh, with the patient. So my, t my front desk just says, hey, by the way, you're going to be getting an email from something called ortho OrthoFi. Please open it and ask them to get it back to you. Can you please get that back to me by Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. or tomorrow by 5 p.m.? Is that, is that going to be a problem? Just ask. Is that going to be a problem? No, fantastic, I'll look forward to seeing it. You've put, they've now made a commitment to you, which means they're more likely, we know that again from the studies, they're more likely to deliver it to you. Uh, now, I want you to notice down here, you see the play button? We talked about training. I made a video of this, 16 minutes long, that every new person who picks up a phone has to go through and answer a quiz on it. It's that important. So again, you know, I use, by the way, this is an aside debut video capture software, really inexpensive, I've got no financial interest. It's amazing, it's screen captures, it's video capture, so you can make training videos for your team. Like for me, it's awesome. Anything on my screen, I can just capture in a video real easily, real quick, I can, I can put a microphone to it and do that. And as a total aside, we can talk about this another time, I don't do letters anymore to doctors, I do videos, because they take me 20 seconds, and my TC sends them out, it's changed my life, and my doctors love it. But Again, this will come up in the video to show them, now we're gonna talk about this part, and I'm narrating as we're going through. So ask yourself, how are you training on it? Our call center knows that once a week, they pull out this sheet, which was made by me in uh, Excel, right? And so these are the 10 places they get rated. They pull up a random new patient call, or any call for that matter, and the call center manager sits down with that individual and says, let's listen to it together. How do you think you did on, how happy did you sound? Well, I don't think I sounded so great. Yeah, I agree, I think you're probably about a five. And they rate it. Again, if you, one thing you'll learn about me is I hate subjectivity. Hey, how'd that go? Pretty good. Did you like that movie? It was all right. How's that restaurant? Pretty good. Like, that doesn't help me. Like, on a scale of one to 10, how'd you like the restaurant? Eight, good, now I know, right? It's important. We want to objectify these things. I don't mean like objectify people, but just, you get it. My point though is, it automatically adds it at the end, and so she got an 86, great, that goes in her file, which I hope you have a folder, a digital folder for every team member, that goes in her folder, because if she's scoring all 90s and says, hey, I'd like a raise, it's a whole lot different than if she's scoring 40s and is on the edge of whether or not we're even gonna keep them in that position. So again, videos for training, objective ways of measuring. This will lower your stress and increase your productivity literally overnight. You're gonna laugh at this, but 
These are like some of the videos we make for our team. One of the that really Don't laugh, but I actually make a video on how to seat a patient. Who's ever been to a doctor's office and felt like you were treated like garbage? A physician's office. Well, you guys are going to great doctors then. But they walk back, they walk ahead of you with a clipboard. They don't even look backwards. They walk to the back and you wonder, where do I go? Where do I sit? Right? You feel like you've been treated like garbage. I said, in my office, you walk next to the patient. You talk to them. You engage them in conversation. When you come to a door, you let them go first. You guide them back to the chair. Every new employee has to watch this. Because when you sit them in a chair, watch what's about to happen. And if you do, I know none of you do this. None of you do this. But and, and the sort of patient doesn't know whether the chair, they should sit in the chair or not. The chair? They ask you, they sit in the chair, yeah, and then the chair. you sit behind so them trying to talk to them as they crane the their neck. Ahead of the right? You're talking the over their shoulder at them. Hey, by the way, how are things going? How are you wearing your aligners? The and they're doing that. It's a much more Do me a favor when you go back to your office, like sit in the chair and try to talk to your assistant over the right shoulder. Tell me how that feels. This isn't about sales, this is about treating people properly, nice right? But what if, so what if you do it the right way? And again, first, it seems silly, right? It seems so away, small, to them. but what if she guides him back there to the chair, the chair, pulls you know, up a chair and sits across from him? Everybody in my office knows when you see the patient, you sit down across from them for 15 seconds, right? How are you? Not, did you wear your elastics? Are you wearing your liners? Hey, how are you doing? How's life? Awesome. And by the way, how are the teeth doing? Good? Awesome. I'm going to take a quick peek. It took me 15 seconds to make them feel wanted and appreciated. So make these videos. That took, what, two minutes to make the video? I used my iPhone. Okay, you guys walk in, pretend you're doing it wrong. Okay, walk in, do it the right way. Great. I mean, it's so easy to do this stuff. But which office would you rather go into? My partner, Doug Shaw, made a video on buttering brackets. I just had a butter bracket. I can tell my team all day long, but if you've got to watch the video and then answer questions, I only made it 13 seconds long, I just cut it out. But he's, he's showing how to butter brackets and how we do this, right? If you're getting an increased number of emergencies, which hopefully you know from your data, data, right? If you're tracking your emergencies and find out what are the emergencies, who are they happening to, what assistance, what type of emergencies are there, you can correct them. So run a report, have your lead assistant run a report. How many broken brackets did we have last month? Great, on your day off, you're gonna spend eight hours, you're gonna go through which assistant helped with each one, and then let's have a training, right? You can do this, it just takes time and energy. As, as I was told years ago, you can have results or you can make excuses. I choose the former. I don't judge anybody who does the, the latter, but that's not my life. I wanna have the best life I can. So now we got data. We got all this data that we got from the new patient call, what do you have? Do you have something useful? Do you understand who this person is? Do you know why they're coming in? Do you know what's motivating them? Do you know what's keeping them from potentially getting started that day? That's what you're doing in, in your discovery one. Now you gotta hand this off to your TC. Well, it's all digital, right? Years ago, we used to have paper, you give it, but you're scanning it in, it's digital, but the TC now has to know they have it. And what are they doing? What's your TC doing? Hopefully, they're not just, you know, seeing them on the, sorry, I'm going back for a second. Hopefully they're not just seeing them and saying, hi, nice to meet you, come on in. By the way, what brings you in? Hopefully they're going out and getting the person and saying, hey, come on back with me, I'm gonna give you the tour and all that stuff, and saying, hey, I heard that blank, blank, blank is why you're coming in. I heard that money is an issue. Let's talk about that a little bit more. You're giving an unfair advantage to the TC when they know everything. And they see, they don't share with the patient, they see this person is not ready to start. Hey, I know you told the, um, the person on the phone, you told Andrea, whoever it was on the phone, um, that you're gonna go for three other consults. And by the way, once you meet Dr. Krieger, you know, we have lots of people come for tons of consults. You're gonna start just like they do, and we're gonna save you the time of going to the other visits, right? Like, just throw it in there. But again, you're already talking at a higher level. You're already increasing your conversion rate just by doing that. So we did discovery number one. What are we doing? Is your TC making phone calls? Is she, make, she or he making videos? Are they texting? What are they doing after they've called before they come in for the new patient appointment? That's the question. Come up with something to connect them. Hi, I'm Glenn. I'm the treatment coordinator, and I'm gonna be helping you today. Great, fantastic, awesome. You know, I'm gonna be seeing you when you come in. Do you have any questions for me? It's just to connect. Hey, I heard about X, Y, and Z. You're reinforcing they made the right choice. Did the other two consults call them? Probably not. So it's important. So now you're in the room, you're working with them. 
We're going to talk about the close, the handoff from the TC to the doctor is really important. Right? So when I walk in the room, it's my TC's room. I'm just supporting. Nobody wants to hear a whole bunch of gobbledygook about what their alignment is, their, their class one, two, or three. You know, they don't want to hear that. Is, we know scientifically that as long as you can establish it, you're an expert in some way, shape, or form, that's all you need to hear. The overwhelming majority, the engineering types, just turn to the engineering type and ask them, I hear a lot of questions in your company, what is it exactly you want to know? Instead of letting them ask you 75 questions, I'm hearing a lot of questions, it sounds like a little bit of doubt, what is it you're, you're trying to get at? What can I help you with? And that, Anybody was at Arthurpreneurs this past year, this past meeting? Yeah, so if you were there, you saw um, Anthony speak on the stage about sales and what have you. The guy's amazing. He spoke about doing these exact things. So get the doctor out of the room as fast as you can. Doctors, I'm telling you this with love in my heart, you're in the room way too long. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do your job while you're in the room, but I'm not going to sit with my patients and talk about the Dallas Cowboys game or the, 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 the Major League you know, World Series. I'm not going to do it. Hey, nice to meet you. I'm Dr. Krieger. What's going on? My TC gives me a, a quick summary. Great. Let me take a quick peek at the x-rays. Let, let me take a look in your mouth. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what's going on. I think this is a case that we can treat in about two years or whatever it might be, and here's how we're going to treat it. What questions could I answer for you? And oddly, 99% of the time, there are none. I say, but don't worry. If you ever have questions, here's my email. You can always reach out to me. I'm always happy to help you. And they never email. They trust you. They don't need to know that you're, you've got four millimeters of crowding. You're going to tell your TC, four millimeters of crowding, moderate crowding upper, moderate crowding lower, class one, two, cusper relationship, molar relationship, midlines, whatever you want to do. But they don't need to know that. They'll hear you calling it off to your TC. If they have a question, they'll ask. But I try to stay in the room for five minutes or less. Usually it's about six or seven. I guarantee if you put a timer, TCs, time your doctors. They're not going to like it. Because the, the, we know for a fact the quicker you get out of the room, the higher conversion rate. The longer you're in the room, the lower the conversion rate. We know that for a fact. The longer you're in the room, generally speaking, the lower your conversion. Overcome issues before they have objections. If you know that money is an issue, you talk about money before they do. You got it on your discovery call. Hey, Mrs. Johnson, I know that um, money is a real issue to you. I just want to let you know that we have very flexible payment plans that anybody can afford. Nobody ever doesn't get work here because they can't afford it. I'm gonna let Kirsten take care of the finances, but other than the money, are there any other concerns you have? No, fantastic. Don't let her bring up the money, you bring up the money. I learned that from Michael Schuster at the Schuster Center. Any Schuster Center grads here? It's a shame, I don't think he does it anymore. It was amazing, it was 20 years ago and he taught me that. And the question is, should we be raising our fees because of inflation? Right, we've talked about that. Is it going to affect us? This comes from Jamie as well. And real quickly, high price, high acceptance rate. The lowest performing acceptance rate was the lowest priced. So don't think that money's the barrier. Money's our problem. We think it's their problem. You're diagnosing their mouth, not their pocketbook. Put your fees wherever you want to put them. I can promise you, having been the highest restorative price to restorative dentist in my community, people trust you, they will say yes. Just deliver on that trust, always. Right, so now we're gonna hit low down payment. Who here thinks low down payment's a good idea? Who thinks it's a bad idea? Who has any opinion? Okay. <laughs> so I have no problem doing a low down payment. Again, I've got OrthoFi in my corner. They're tracking everything. They're following up on everything. I feel good about it. Right, don't be afraid about extending payments. Just honestly, raise your hands on, if you're not gonna raise your hands on anything else, raise your hands on this one. Who here believes that extending payments beyond the end of treatment time is a bad idea? You're going to get defaulted, they're going to walk away, they're going to screw you over. Who here thinks it's fine? You can extend it way past. Okay, let's see what the data says. Way past. Way past. Way past. If they're going to default on you, they're going to default most likely when they're 10% through treatment. This is from 200 practices from OrthoFi's data. If they're going to default on you, it's going to happen in the first 50% of treatment, generally speaking. This is where treatment ended. 100% of treatment done, look at the default rate down there. Now granted, there's less payment to happening at that point of the game, but if they're going to default on you, it's going to be at the beginning. It's not going to be at the end. Interesting, right? I love data. Data's our friend. So 
Let's talk about digital co-diagnosis. This is something I spoke about for 20 years when it came to photography, but I just couldn't keep it out of this presentation. I'm gonna go through it quickly, but you'll, you'll understand where I'm coming from. Digital co-diagnosis is a process in which the patient helps diagnose the case themselves before any treatment is rendered. Instead of saying to them, hey, you have this problem, you help them. It's kind of like my cousin Vinny, you know, when he goes, what are these things? Oh, those are called screens, right. What are these things on the tree, the green things, the leaves? If you haven't seen my cousin Vinny, go watch the, the court scene, because it's perfect. It's called motivational interviewing. You're gonna see more of it in healthcare over the next decade. It's where you get walked down the path by your provider instead of them just handing it to you in a paternalistic fashion. Because you know what happened on this guy's weekend, right? It hurts me just looking at it. But every picture does tell a story. And it's been proven that nothing tells a story better in dentistry than a really good photograph. That's why photographs are so important. So I could tell this person, look, you lost all your teeth. Or I could say to them, hey, you probably had a lot more teeth, obviously, before we started. Just out of curiosity, how many teeth do you think you've lost? It makes a difference when it comes out of their mouth than when it comes out of yours. When it comes out of their mouth, they own it. Hey, does it look to you like, like there's something going on? What do you think that is? A cavity? Yeah, I think you're right. They own it now because it came out of their mouth. It's been proven. We know that scientifically. So I wrote about it originally in 2007 for Dental Economics. And what makes it so different than everything else is that it's completely patient-driven. <clears throat> you got to have great images, which is why I put that down. And you got to fight the urge to jump in the room and go, here's what you need. You just want to show if there's something. A 12-year-old kid comes in with class one crowding. You're going to tell him it's an 18-month treatment. Mom knows. But I treat like 60% adults. That's my sweet spot. The stuff you hate treating, I love treating. Like, as long as you give me two teeth, I'll move something. I love, I need, I need two, right? That's the old, anybody here from Oklahoma? I'm from Texas, and Texas, Oklahoma, so we always joke about how do you know that the toothbrush was invented in Oklahoma? Because it was invented anywhere else, so we call it the teeth brush. So, long, you gotta be in Oklahoma, Texas kind of joke there. So, you're walking them down the path of discovery as we go there. So let's take this picture right here. What do you see here? You see a class two end on, or class three, sorry, class three relationship. Right, look at the front teeth. But what you're not looking at is mirrors. You're not looking at retractors. It's not too dark. You can look at this because it's lit properly and you can see it well. So in my office, next to my, next to my desk, I've got this. An ideal bite. Notice it doesn't say a pretty smile. An ideal bite, because if I can make every occlusion look like that, I'd be very, very happy. So, when I show them this right next to it, I can say to them, hey, by the way, when you look over here, do you see the, the point on this molar? Where does it hit the lower molar? On the front, the middle, or the back? And the answer is the middle. I say, great, so when I look at you, does it look the same as that? No. Right? So. Where do I really want this to be? Do I want it to be here or here? You want it here, right? That's motivational interviewing. Easy. It took me 10 seconds. But now they understand what I'm looking at. I'm not talking class one, two, or three. So basically, either your upper is too far back or your lower is too, too far forward. And do you want to guess what kind of little thing I can put in your mouth that stretches, that goes from the top to the bottom to help change it? It rhymes with dubber band. <laughs> and they go, rubber bands? I go, exactly. They said it, I'm agreeing with them, right? And by the way, if you don't wear those rubber bands, do you think we're gonna get any change? You're right. Like this changes the game, motivational interviewing. Play with it, have fun with it, role play it. I've been doing, I sell orthodontic cases, I use the word sell, I sell orthodontic cases that are five to seven thousand dollars, eight thousand, nine thousand. Routinely in restorative dentistry, my cases were sixty to ninety thousand dollars for people who came in for a cleaning and were completely destroyed. They thought they needed a cleaning. In our world, people come in because they know they, they want what we have. They're coming in wanting what we have to provide. They know it's $6,000, and we have trouble selling that? Come on, we can do it. So in my office, this is what it looks like. Sorry for the bad picture, but there's an ideal bite, and there's my screen. It's easy. Does this look like this? No, it looks different. How? Let's talk about it. it takes you a minute. Bye, I'm gonna leave you with Kirsten. She's gonna take care of the financials. That's what I say. Do you have any questions that aren't about financials that Kirsten's gonna take care of? No, fantastic, so nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to helping you. You know, see you later, and I leave her. So the better images, we're gonna get through this pretty quickly. I just wanna talk a word about cameras, because I was the camera guy. I had a blog on cameras. I, I lectured around the world on cameras. 
and photography, the camera really doesn't matter. A, a DSLR is better than a, uh, any other kind of camera. It's tougher to use. Just do me a favor. If you're going to use a camera, <laughs> I mean, seriously, just know how to use your camera, OK? Just don't buy something because somebody told you to buy it. Mirrors and retractors are the most important part. A DSLR camera is always better than anything else. More control, better images, always. But if you can master mirrors and retractors, you can get really good images using other stuff. But if you're looking for the best, a, a single lens reflex camera is always the best. But this was in my office. Each of my team members had one of these. You go get a custom made case. You get a Wii lanyard. You drill a couple of holes, put one at each station. Now you can post. It's on Wi Fi. You can immediately send pictures up onto the web for social media. They're like, you can buy a used one for like 150 bucks. The setup's $225 there. I'm not telling you to do it instead of an SLR, but I am telling you, come on, let's leverage every tool we have at our hands to grow our practices. If every assistant has a camera at the chair, what are the odds you're going to have more social media posts? This is with an iPhone XS. This is four years ago technology. It's a nice image, not ideal. I still want my SLR, but every one of you would be happy with this. But when you're in a stage in Europe lecturing on photography, this is not the image you want to be showing. But it's all about the mirrors and retractors. Your images are too dark, it's your mirrors and retractors. There's not enough light going back there. You missed your second molars, it's your mirrors and retractors. And again, uh, shameless plug here. I, I don't know if I talk about it later on, but you can go to uh, my, I have a orthopreneurs.com. In there, there are courses. as a clinical photography course you can take. Uh, that'll train your team beautifully. Um, yeah, I, I did it a year and a half ago, and people love it. But, but this is my little assistant, Courtney. God bless her. Love her to death. She doesn't work with me anymore. She's a mom of two at home now. Uh, she had wrist problems that she thought was from cheerleading, but it was That's early onset general. lupus stuff in her elbows. She's fine. But she's 105 pounds, five foot one, and she, look at the size of the camera she's handling. With wrist problems, not from the camera. So anybody out there who wants to say, I can't use a big camera, I refuse. Again, get over it. This is Courtney taking a full set of images in less than probably three minutes, start to finish. And just so you can see, she's going to show you the images. It's perfect. She knows what she's doing. You can get perfect images. You can do anything you want to do. What gets attention gets fixed. You want great images? Spend a lot of time working on it. Go watch that course. I guarantee you, your mirrors and your retractors and your positioning are the problem. Because I can do it with any camera, anywhere, as long as I got my mirrors and my retractors. You got to lay them flat for occlusals. You got to. But again, I'll show you this one. I use that retractor. Sometimes I use split retractors. But again, she's not wearing gloves. I always get hell for that one. Just keep in mind, if she's got gloves on, you're treating it as if it's dirty, right? You wrapping your camera? Hmm. So we're wearing gloves and we're cross contaminating the camera every time. I choose to believe her hands are staying clean because I get closer picking a shade and restorative dentistry. Nothing's dirty. So if you're wearing gloves, you got to wrap your camera. Or you have to wipe the whole camera down every time, which I would not recommend. Surgery, they wrap the camera. Oral surgeons wrap their camera in plastic. So you have to decide which way it is. But if you're putting gloves on and you're not wrapping the camera, something's not making sense to me. So again, this is her whole set. Number three, a more positive team culture. How do you hire? How do you hire? Is it a want ad? People walk into a cattle call. I've done it. Doesn't work. Not where I am. But more importantly, what I've learned is, who do you hire? Which one of these two am I hiring for my office? <laughs> like, this is the essence of dogs versus cats, like in this one picture right here. Right? But is there anybody in this room who thinks that that face? Do I want to see that on Monday morning? Like, come on. Like, you're asking me to do what? And this one's like, sure, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> if only it was that easy, right? Here's another one. Who are we going to hire? Now, by the way, this is a great illustration. I hope you saw it. The young lady on the left has such a beautiful smile, doesn't she? It comes from her soul. You can see it. She has a peg lateral on her upper left, too. But it just shows you, you can have a gorgeous smile that comes from the soul and it just shines through, right? Like, amazing. But let me show you something. This woman, she shows up like this. Would you hire her? Not in a million. We have hired her, right? We've all hired her at some point. But you just got fooled. 
She works at a Walmart in Maryland, and she is a gas. If you follow her, she does photos, and her thing is, she, uh, this is my favorite one right here. But she just takes pictures with all the Walmart goods, and they post it on her social media. It's such a great gig. But again, you go back, it means you got to ask questions. you got to learn. you got to give them a chance in your office. Where you don't judge on what you see at face value. Ask the questions. Have them come in for a week. We don't have to hire them instantly. I mean, right now, we joke in our office that if they come in, my, my partner said he interviewed three people. I said, great. Um, did you hold a mirror up to them to see if they had a you know, breath? He says, yes, they're good. They're where they hired. Because where I am, it's so hard to hire that if they breathe or have a pulse, you're hired and we'll take our chances. I'll hire that cat right now, I'm telling you. <laughs> but I just love the way they did this. Like, she's in there. I mean, just everything is hysterical. I mean, just, she's just having fun. But I never saw that when I first looked. So we're going to talk about leadership real quick. Not every day can be like this, right? This, my team, they want it. I do it. I'm like the little brother, right? I get dressed up. I've got to do all, like all this. I'm Buddy the Elf in this one, by the way, my personal choice. But they're not always so happy. It's not always so upbeat, right? Like any family, you're going to go through challenges, and you're going to have to be a leader. So I'm going to ask you now, morning meeting, raise your hands high. Do you have a morning meeting every day? Thank you. For those of you who don't have a morning meeting, turn to the person nearest you who is and ask them why. Talk to them about it. It's super important to check in in the morning for the day. Do you do one? Yes. What's it all about? That's up to you. You get to figure out what the morning meeting is all about. Right? But I stay out of the morning meeting. I don't do anything in the morning meeting. I don't talk about starts. I don't talk about Google reviews for the day. I don't talk about the difficult patient we're going to have to put into the private room or the mother who has a question. I let my team, I empower them to do that. Right? The biggest mistake you can be is a micromanager. If you're meeting doctors, I apologize, if you're meeting as a doctor taking charge for 15 minutes and telling everybody everything, I think there should be a discussion about that. The team needs to play a role, and you will be happier, doctor, if they run the show. You do the ortho, you kiss babies, shake hands, <laughs> love the mamas, love on the mothers, Love on the people, love on your team. Fill your building with as much love and compassion as you humanly can. That is your job, and to do exceptional orthodontics. Everything else can be doled out to somebody else. They're smart, they're good, but you gotta train. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. My purpose is to be a mentor. So my role in the morning meeting is to talk about, hey, who wants to learn how to budget properly? Let's talk about some budgeting secrets. Let's talk about creating a solvency account where you put 10% of your income aside from every paycheck. And here's how you do it. That's what I do in the morning meetings. I talk about motivation. I talk about things I've learned that maybe they're interested in. I talk about a book, maybe, that's going to help them in their life, not in my practice. They're doing enough for my practice. I don't need to push them any harder. I need to give back and help them in their lives. Great book. If you've not read it, you must read it. You see that look right there? That's how many people feel in meetings. Read this book. It will, anybody read this book? It is so easy to read. You can read this in like a night. It's told as a story. It's such a great book. And you'll understand the four kinds of meetings that are out there and why you should be doing each one. Let's hit the last thing here. I want to see how, much, how I'm doing on time. How am I doing on time? I got 15 minutes? I'm going to talk really slowly. Um, nobody ever complains about getting out early, but I don't think we will. Um, so less errors. So there are three errors. I could talk about literally 50 places we could reduce errors, right? If any Six Sigma people in here, we could have that conversation. But technology is one place we can reduce errors. I'm going to talk about the formula, and we're going to talk about zones. Ooh, cryptic. What's he going to talk about? So let's talk about technology really fast. Use technology to become more efficient, right? Like, I remember my dad's dental office back in the day where there was just a paper schedule. And that was the technology. There was no technology. But you press the x-ray button or the amalgamator. Right? So I, who here goes back far enough to remember where there were no latex gloves? Like, it's crazy to imagine, anybody newer in this, that there was a day that my father, not me, because when I started dental school, they just started latex gloves when the HIV uh, epidemic came out. So, you basically, my father would walk in, hey, how you doing? He'd be washing his hands with soap and water. Things good, everything great. Okay, let's take a peek. 
Hunk. <laughs> you know, nice, raise your hands nice and high. Who here would not join orthodontics today clinically if it involved not wearing gloves? <laughs> it's so funny. I remember my father cursing and screaming the first day I had to wear gloves. I can't feel any of these damn gloves. And it was just funny. But technology is meant to help you become more efficient or to do something for you. Right? I love my team and I would never fire any of my team because of technology, but it certainly keeps me from having to hire more. There are places that technology can make me way more efficient. We've introduced some remote monitoring in my practice. The number of patients I see on a daily basis is dropping. Sometimes you need to spend to make. The number one comment they ever like, I don't want to spend money on technology. Raise your fees 2%. Nobody's going to say no. Like, just spend the money on the technology. Be more efficient. Make your patients lives happy. It doesn't mean just because it's technology it's better. But there is some technology that is better. And you should go learn about it. Like remote monitoring, 3D printing, tracking data, financials. Like I told you, OrthoFi, for me, was a game changer. We had always had trouble with the financial coordinator. Getting somebody, the numbers are wrong. You got to do refunds. We actually missed the date to get a refund from insurance companies. And we lost $70,000 in one year. Because Now, is it my, my financial coordinator's fault? No, it's my fault. I fell asleep at the wheel. Everything's my fault. I'm just there to mentor. But it's nice now that it happens automatically. You still need somebody to watch over it. But for me, that was the day we put in OrthoFi was a game changer for me. And there are places like remote monitoring. The day I put that in, that changed the game as well. So start thinking about what technology you can put in there to make life easier. Because, again, team members, this is not a free pass for you. When you get taken out of one duty because you got technology, it means you can dive deeper into another. Maybe become better at photography. Maybe come read some more books on closing. There's a whole bunch of things you could be doing. But don't lose sight and be short-sighted. It can relieve a lot of your stress and a lot of your burden. It has for me, for sure. Now, the formula is something I came up with. I, I'm actually starting to write a book about it because everybody I talk to about it is like, wow, you should write a book about this. And everybody always has great ideas what you should do with your life, right? <laughs> so I was getting tired and fed up of having somebody come in my office for an interview. And I'd say, so, you know, have you ever uh, worked with the CBCT? Yeah. How good are you with it? I'm OK. You do, you, you're OK? OK, good. Have you uh, ever used a motion appliance? Mm, a little bit. I'm not really that good with it. What does that tell me? I, I, what kind of column can I give them? <laughs> what, where can I put them? You know, they're going to do a working interview, and they're going to try to impress me. But where am I going to put these people? I need objectivity. You know that about me already. I've warned you about that. So I came up with this idea. What if I asked them from zero to four at the interview? What if when I do a review with you, I set standards that are objective? And I said, so um, I'm going to tell you, you're a new interviewee with me. Zero to four, we're going to tell you what this is. So zero means I've never heard of it. I've never seen it. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what you're talking about. A one is I've heard of it, but I've never done it. A two is, I've done it, but I'm not comfortable at all. A three is, I'm comfortable, but no way am I a master. And a four is, I'm a master of this procedure. I could teach this to anybody in the office. You could send me to another office, and I would shine. So now if I ask you, hey, how good are you with taking CBCTs? Mm, I'm a two. I've done it, but I'm not really that comfortable. Or I'm a, a, zero, I, I, a one. I've heard of it, but I've never seen one. I've never done it. Now the conversation gets really easy. And here's the key to this. Hold on, there we go. Anything above the line is not independent worker. I can't put it in a column when they start. Anything below the line, if they're being honest, is something. So now you're a new assistant, you came on board. I, I've now, I've got 40 things I'm asking you about. Two, one, four, zero, four, one. Great, now I can collate, good. Scheduler, when you schedule her schedule, assuming on the working interview we verify it, that she actually is telling the truth, when you set up her column, make sure you set her up with all the things that she's a three or a four. Don't give her any zeros, ones, or twos. We're going to train on those. And by the way, Cindy, for your first review within 30 days, I need you to be a one at these, a two at these, a three at these, and a four at these. It's easy. Now they know exactly the roadmap they need to go, and there's no more subjectivity. Right? I think you need a little bit more work with your bondings. What does that mean? Can you work independently or can't you? Because that's all we care about at the end of the day. Can we give them a column? 
Can they work on their own? So to me, that I called it the formula because everything has to have a catchy name, but I always remember zero to four, and it, and it really works well. And this is arguably my favorite, favorite game changer. I texted my partner again after I reviewed my presentation today. I sent him, I said, dude, you got to do this. We got to get, because he runs the practices now and I run orthopreneurs and I speak and I really, I try to make a difference outside the office. He makes all the big difference inside the office in terms of making sure things run. He's my best friend. We met in residency. I graduated school in 1992. He graduated the same school in 2012. My classmates were his instructors. And now we're partners. And it's amazing. He's the better half of the partnership. So these are two pictures of two very different events. And I want you to remember this picture, because you're going to learn about the zones right now. This is Eduardo Briseño. I think I screwed up his name, and I apologize to him. He's in like a think tank near Palo Alto area. Um, and he comes up with really great ideas. And he did a TED Talk on how to get better at all the things you care about. Not just your work, but everything. How to get better. And he talks about the performance zone. If there's one takeaway today, this is your takeaway. I want you to listen. Can you turn up the volume, please? Is that the most effective people and teams in any domain do something we can all emulate. They go through life deliberately alternating between two zones the learning zone and the performance zone. The learning zone is when our goal is to improve. Then we do activities designed for improvement, concentrating on what we haven't mastered yet, which means we have to expect to make mistakes, knowing that we will learn from them. That is very different from what we do when we're in our performance zone, which is when our goal is to do something as best as we can, to execute. Then we concentrate on what we have already mastered, and we try to minimize mistakes. Both of these zones should be part of our lives, but being clear about when we want to be in each of them, with what goal, focus, and expectations, helps us better perform and better improve. The performance zone maximizes our immediate performance, while the learning zone maximizes our growth and our future performance. The reason many of us don't improve much, despite our hard work, is that we tend to spend almost all of our time in the performance zone. This hinders our growth and ironically, over the long term, also our performance. So what does the learning zone look like? So the point he's making is, look at these two pictures again. Which one of these is trying to perform in the performance zone and learn in the learning zone? And which one of these is learning in the performance zone? Do you think there was a plan here? <laughs> I mean, there was a plan. Was it well thought out? Was this practiced numerous times on a smaller ramp over a ball pit? Did he master the center of gravity, the speed? Probably not. What about this guy? You think he climbed two feet off the ground te testing new handholds? The reason we fail in a lot of what we do in the practices is because we get that new assistant or we get that new technique or we get that new product. Oh, cool, show me how to do this at the chair with a patient when the pressure's on and you're in the performance zone, the message you're getting is you need to have admin days and you need to practice. And you don't need to roll it out until you pass the learning zone. Because if you're pushing it out in the performance zone, you're, you're doomed for failure. If you're gonna go watch my video on photography and then a new patient comes in, go get it, you're gonna fail. You, in my office photography, you're shooting on admin days and shooting and you're shooting and you're shooting and you're shooting over the quote unquote ball pit. Who cares if you make a mistake? Let's get better. The goal is to get better. In the performance zone, the goal is to do it right. And there's a big difference. And this applies to everything you do in your life, whether it's golf. Nobody who's a serious golfer goes out to the course and goes, I don't need to practice. I'm just going to start hitting. You do if you want to waste money. But nobody does it. Nobody buys a boat. Well, some do. and says, I'm going to go just drive the boat. I'm not going to learn how to control it at all. It becomes catastrophic. So learn the, the learning zone versus the performance zone and learn when you should go into the performance zone and when you need to stay in the learning zone. This will change your life because you do not want to end up as the guy on the left, which actually is a picture from a mommy blog about her amazing sons who love these tricks. I'm like, he's five. I don't want to know what this kid's going to do when he's 18. 
So always remember that life is a grindstone. I had this in my first office. The guy before I bought the office had it up on his, and I left it for 16 years. Life is like a grindstone. Whether it grinds you down or polishes you up depends upon what you're made of. I want you to watch this. I don't know why, but every single time I watch this, something about it makes me almost want to cry, like in happiness. I can't control it and I don't know why, but these are the big 10 track and field championships. I think this is the um, 750 meter, if I'm not mistaken. And I think her name is Heather Dorinden. Any Minnesota grads here? Right on. She's from Minnesota. She competed for Minnesota. I don't know if you ever heard of her. She's a four-time one-mile road race champion in the United States. She's a remarkable human being. But we talk about life throwing things at you. Bad things are going to happen. And you have the ability to choose how you want to respond or not. The old saying is winners win. But they don't always win. But there's a reason they do. And I want you to watch what's about to happen here. It's crazy. I think, I don't know if there was two laps they finished. I think there's two laps. That's, so that's Heather Dorinden. Now, she had two choices. Watch what happens. She actually starts chasing them down. Crazy. I don't know why I get so emotional when I watch this. I've shown this probably 20 times over the last five years. And literally every time it almost brings me to tears. To see that kind of effort, God, she just won. Crazy, right? So if she can do that, what about you and your life? I think you can do it. What's the biggest thing you face? I mean, honestly, look around the room. So many of you face so much. Single moms, kids. Married with, with a kid, you got to work, come home. I know what you're going through. Hopefully your doctors see it as well. But I, I always want you to remember that. And the most important question you can take away today is, what is your journey? Sure, we talked about some ways to become more profitable. Sure, we talked about sales. Sure, we talked about how to performance versus learning zone. I told you, I could literally do this for two days and give you every detail of every single thing we just talked about, but I was given an hour, so I apologize. But when you leave here, if you get a 20% higher case acceptance rate, that's amazing. But if you can change the world and help other people, hopefully this inspires you to do better. That's the whole goal. You can find me here. Um, if you run across my middle daughter in New York City, just throw her a buck. I need to save money, okay? <laughs> She's off the payroll, kind of. Um, but if you, please, the best way to get me is always Facebook. If you email me, I get so many, it's hard to get to. But hit me up on Facebook, just message me. If you're not on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, you can get me there as well. Um, but definitely, please, the biggest thanks you can give me is by going out and doing one thing better in the world to help somebody else. With that, thank you.